Welcome to the Level Podcast. In this episode, Dave Gibson, a level expert coach who is a registered naturopath, osteopath, hypnotherapist, and sleep coach, will share with you helpful tips on how to stress less and sleep more. He will start by looking at the science of stress, how and why we get stressed, and then move through why we need sleep what does it do for us, and how to have a good night's sleep. Dave will also cover 10 top sleep steps to a great night's sleep with practical ideas and look at how a proper diet and exercise can positively influence your sleep. Hi, my name is Dave Gibson. I'm a registered naturopath, osteopath, hypnotherapist and sleep coach. Thanks so much for listening to this 30 minute podcast called Stress Less and Sleep More. We'll start by very briefly looking at the science of stress, how and why we get stressed and then move through why we need sleep. What does it do for us and cover off 10 top sleep steps to a great night's sleep. We'll talk through some practical ideas and then we'll look at how to create balance through proper diet, exercise and more. And not all stress is bad stress. We're actually designed to cope with stress. If we have too little stress, we become inactive and laid back. And there's an optimum level of stress where we feel engaged and invigorated by life. However, once we get over that stress curve, once we get into exhaustion, anxiety, panic and breakdown, that's when stress becomes too much for us. When looking at stress, I find it interesting to look at the evolution of the brain, the trione brain, um, as it's called. We started off with a a lizard brain, which is the autopilot fight or flight part of us. Then we developed into a mammal with a mammalian brain, our limbic system, emotions, habits, attachments. And eventually we got to our human brain, the neocortex, where we understand consciousness, reasoning, rationalization. So our development went lizard first, mammal second, human third. And our thinking is processed in that way. It's processed lizard, mammal, human. And our instincts are for fight or flight. The first thing that we see is, is this danger? Do I need to move away from it? Is this good for me? Is this bad for me? And we process all of our input all of our sensory input first goes through this fight or flight lizard brain, which produces adrenaline and cortisol, increases our blood pressure, increases our breathing, blood flow to muscles, releases blood sugar. It literally pumps us up for action. At the same time, once we engage this fight or flight system, we actually dial down our ability to think. Our flexible thinking gets dwarfed by this fight or flight instinctive response to stress so when we've got anxiety building we actually then engage the mammalian brain from this point so our emotion whether we're angry happy or sad actually starts off from fight or flight and then it's processed through our emotions how do i feel in response to this stress and we have a reflex response to that you know and our ability to cope with that reflex response actually comes from the human brain the cerebral cortex which is involved in the problem solving, coordination and abstract thinking. So we're faced with a situation, we have an emotional response to it, and then we think through what to do, having gone through the lizard and mammalian brain first. So way before we get to what are we going to do with this, in terms of our response to stress, we've already got our body reacting whether we want it to or not. So once we feel anxiety and stress, we have got this energy metabolism. We've got this pumped up body. We've got this autonomic response to this with adrenaline being produced. Whether we want it to or not, we have this fight or flight system that starts off the whole process. And our emotions and our ability to think it through only kick in on top of that. So our psychological responses have a physiological fight or flight underneath it so stress produces adrenaline and then we think through our reaction to how we feel how our arousal is and what our motivations are occur in response to this pumped up fight or flight system and when we feel stressed we already have that increased desire to fight or flight within us because of the hormones 
of that process, adrenaline and cortisol. And our somatic nervous system, how we feel, how our body is reacting to this. So how our reflexes are working, how do our muscles feel, do I feel tense, actually occurs on top of all of that. So our behavior comes after we've had this physiological and psychological response and we then work out what are we going to do with all of this. And if we're feeling stressed, we feel it in our body, our muscles feel tight. And then our brain thinks we're stressed because we feel stressed. So we have this sort of loop going round where if I'm stressed, I feel stressed. If I feel stressed, I must be stressed. And at this point, we have this sympathetic nervous system, this fight or flight overriding everything. And our breathing increases and we feel this through our body and our thought processes, our creativity, our concentration all decrease. And what we really need to do is to engage something called the parasympathetic nervous system, the relaxation response, the rest and digest response. And that's how all of these relaxation techniques kick in. It's because they help us relax the muscles. They help us slow down. They help us decrease the rate of breathing. They help us breathe out more than we breathe in. And that physical response actually then feeds back increases the parasympathetic nervous system, the relaxation response, and decreases the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight response. So changing what we're doing physically in terms of our breathing, in terms of how we're holding our body, will feed back into our anxiety response in terms of the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. Also how we think feeds back into this situation. So we're not under threat from animals, but we're under threat from our own thinking. When we project into the future, we're looking at being short of time. We're looking at problems. We go to the problems that we've got in our lives and we project these problems in the future into our present thinking. And that then creates a change in our emotions that then change the individual responses for cortisol and adrenaline. So our thinking needs to change and that's where meditation kicks in. And recently, we've also had information and research done where we now know that increased blood pressure can then drive feelings of anxiety. In the past, we've always thought that anxiety promotes an increase in the heart rate, an increase in blood pressure. But actually, we now know that the feedback loop can work the other way. And what we know is that when we increase our blood pressure through poor diets or through lack of exercise, the brain then registers this as a problem and it increases our levels of anxiety. It increases how we're reacting to the world. So it's our blood pressure change, poor diet, lack of exercise that then creates anxiety. And we've always thought that it's the other way. So all of these feedback loops can change the way we feel. They can change the way we think about the world. They can increase our levels of anxiety and stress. So food, exercise goes both ways. It changes the way we feel and it creates more anxiety and stress. And when it comes to sleep, stress is the biggest single problem in terms of people both getting to sleep and staying asleep. And we create a big perpetual loop of problems when we don't sleep in terms of the ability that we have or lack of ability to cope with daily life. So lack of sleep produces tiredness, we can't cope, we get low self-esteem, we get feelings of worry, and this then leads to poor sleep, which then leads to tiredness, coping with daily life. So we have this circle, this vicious circle, where stress causes poor sleep, and poor sleep causes stress. And this then leads to changes in our metabolism. We increase the amount of cortisol in the system, which has massive effects. So lack of sleep produces this stress hormone and the stress hormone cortisol is then feeding back into lack of sleep. And one of the biggest changes of this is how it affects our metabolism. When we increase cortisol, we increase insulin resistance. We get a change in the hunger hormones, the hunger hormone called ghrelin, that tells us that we need food increases and the hunger form hormone leptin that tells us when we are full decreases. So we have a, a totally dysfunctional metabolism where we are creating the desire for more food. That more food isn't the healthy food. It's calorifically dense food. So sugar and fat. So we then increase our weight that then causes problems. We also increase the poorer food that then causes less sleep. So we have this whole dysfunction going on. 
so our metabolism's knocked out of sync and our immune function is decreased too. We create our immune system at night. So stress, lack of sleep feeds into lots of different systems and these systems then affect the way that we sleep. So let's now move on to talking about sleep, the science of sleep, what it does for us and how we can use sleep to help us cope with stress. What's the other way that sleep feeds back into our sense of well-being? So let's now talk about sleep. What does it do for us and what can we do to get better night's sleep? Now we know that sleep impacts every single cell in the body. Every single cell requires sleep to rest and rejuvenate. If we don't get this, we get an increase in our weight, we get increased risk of diabetes, cancer, mental health problems, heart disease. Every single part of us requires sleep to get the optimum amount of health. Now, part of our system of sleep is determined by light. And with regards to light, most of us would relate to melatonin being our sleep hormone, which is produced in the evening in the absence of light. But also it's the light in the morning that's important because light in the morning helps stimulate the release of cortisol, which is our wake hormone. And it's the difference between the brightness of light in the morning and the darkness of the evening that strengthens our body clock or circadian rhythm. So light is the driver of sleep. More light in the morning, less light in the evening is exactly what we need. And the other determinator of our sleep is something called adenosine. The more we're awake, the more adenosine we produce as we burn energy in the brain. And that adenosine is like a sand timer filling up. And when we get to the evening, the tipping point of adenosine causes us to need sleep. So we have the desire of sleep from melatonin. We have the need of sleep from this adenosine, which is what caffeine blocks. And we get this natural sleep window somewhere between 10 and 12 at night. And that would be after the sun went down prehistorically. So we're timed in line with the planet. But we also have our chronotypes, which is our natural sleep preferences. And some of us like to go to bed early. Some of us like to go to bed late. But most of us need this 10 till 12 o'clock at night sleep window. So sleeping in line with your preferences, sleeping in line with your genetic preference for sleep is something to determine too, in terms of the quantity and quality of sleep that we get. And you can do that by looking at some of the online surveys. There's lots of surveys in terms of the morningness and the eveningness questionnaire. And there's one by a guy called Dr. Michael Bruce, which is a brilliant piece of research on our different sleep genes and different sleep chronotypes. So if you're not sure about your sleep preferences, have a look online, determine which type of sleeper you are and try and sleep in line with your genetic sleep preference, i.e. when do I naturally feel tired? And one of the questions I'm asked a lot is how much sleep do we need? For most adults, it's somewhere between seven and nine hours. Again, we all are different. Some of us have shorter sleep needs, some of us longer. But in general, for an adult, it's seven to nine hours. If you're sleeping too little, probably stress. If you're sleeping too much, it could actually be that you're feeling under the weather and a bit depressed. So Ideally, somewhere between seven and nine hours and waking up without an alarm would be the perfect way to judge if you've got enough sleep because that's your body naturally waking you up rather than you setting the deadline. So ideally, let your body set the deadline and uh, wake up without an alarm, get seven to nine hours in general. And in terms of the architecture of sleep, the stages of sleep, we now know a lot more about what each individual component of sleep does for us. And those of us with sort of Fitbits and all of these tracking devices might have done a little bit more delving into this. So we have four stages of sleep. Stage one is literally drifting off. We call it light sleep. Stage two light sleep is longer. We have about 40 to 50 percent of this during the night and that helps with information processing. Then we get into deep sleep. A lot of us regard that as being a sort of gold standard. That's what we're aiming at because deep sleep does so much. It increases the amount of growth hormone that's in the body, which helps us restore, and it helps us brain detox. 90% of the brain's detoxification occurs at night. And then we move into rapid eye movement, and that's when we dream. It helps with promotion of creativity. It's our memory, and it's our emotional balance. So REM sleep is our emotional balancer. As we dream, we're into the emotions, and in fact, the interesting part of sleep is as we go around these stages or sleep cycles, we get more REM sleep at the end of the night and more deep sleep at the start of the night, which is why it's important to get seven to eight hours. If you don't get that seven to eight hours, seven to nine hours, you get out of the bed the wrong side. And that's because your emotional stability 
isn't restored because you haven't had enough dream or REM sleep. And every single cognitive process is refreshed by sleep. Our attention, our focus, our flexibility, our creativity, our memory, everything about the brain needs sleep. And we tend to underperform at work. We tend to underperform in life if we don't get this cognitive restoration, apart from all of the other benefits. And there's actually been research done on well-being and sleep. The sweet spot tends to be around eight hours. We maximize our feelings of wellness if we get sleep and it tends to be eight hours which is right in the middle of that seven to nine recommended um, amount of sleep that we need and that restoration of our emotions that ability to cope with stress actually comes through our dreams when we dream we process all of the thoughts of the day we're logging it into our memory and those dreams actually start in that reptilian brain which is firing all the neurons it's then filtered into the cerebral cortex. So the sort of activation of dreams start in, in our fight or flight system, which is why we tend to have nightmares if we've had a bad day. You know, we're processing the emotions, we're processing them through our dreams, and our dreams accurately reflect how we're feeling. If we're feeling happy, we'll have happy dreams. If we're feeling sad, we'll have sad dreams. And that rinsing of the emotions through the brain is a really important part of coping with stress. And our dreams tend to reflect where we are in the world. So in terms of our nightmares, for example, if you look at the, the sort of suggestions that are most researched on Google as to why we are dreaming, in the developed world, the thing that we're frightened about most is losing our teeth. In Asia and Africa and South America, when we have nightmares, we have nightmares about snakes. So where we are in the world, what we're going through reflects our dreams and our ability to cope with stress requires that process. So getting that full amount of sleep then dictates how we cope with stress. So what tips can enable us to maximize our sleep? What are the top 10 sleep tips? So we start off with consistency. Our body clock, our circadian rhythm expects us to go to bed and wake up at the same time, seven days a week. So ideally, get to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time. If you can't do that, you know, we've got a social life, try and anchor your wake up time. Don't have a long weekend lie-in to catch up on sleep. This creates something called social jet lag, knocks your body out of context, creates dysfunction in all of your systems. So consistency, same bed and wake time, maximizes quality and quantity. Then it's about what happens in the morning. We always think about the evening being what sleep is all about, but it actually starts in a calm morning routine and sunlight. We're designed to get outside, we're designed to get a lot of sunlight. In the winter, if you can't do that, get one of those SAD lamps, blast your eyes with 10,000 looks. If you're outside, it's even better because you're getting natural sunlight, stimulates cortisol, wakes you up, gets you going for the day. And in the day, it's important to eat the right things. Eat all the colors of the rainbow to provide a range of nutrients. Typically, we talk about magnesium in sleep, so nuts and seeds, fresh fish, are all important and getting that right balance of the food is really important. Then we talk about what we drink. We all know about caffeine. Caffeine blocks adenosine buildup. It blocks our need for sleep. And if you remember back, adenosine is our chronometer of how long we've been awake. So if we're blocking it with caffeine, we literally don't register that we been awake we literally don't register that we need sleep and caffeine as a stimulant also produces adrenaline and we all have different sensitivities to caffeine some of us can drink it later in the day without affecting our sleep but in general caffeine has a half life of six hours so it takes six hours to reduce half of its effect so if you're having caffeine at four o'clock half a cup of coffee is still in your body at 10 o'clock at night and that exactly would interfere with your sleep so if you're having problems with sleep consider when you're having caffeine stop caffeine around lunchtime if you're having problems with sleep it's something to consider so drink lots of water in the day it increases your ability to cope mentally so we now know that, that hydration is a key part of the brain coping with stress and look at when you have your last drop of alcohol alcohol is a great sedative it can knock you out but it interferes with the quality of sleep that you get and the quantity because it disturbs your REM sleep. It wakes you up in the middle of the night. So ideally, if you have a drink at night, stop around three hours before you sleep. That would be the ideal thing to consider in terms of quality and quantity of sleep. 
Moving on to exercise, we know that exercise is great because it produces endorphins, helps us cope with stress, but it's also important for sleep. Even 20 minutes walking three times a week is proven to help sleep. So exercise in the morning would be perfect. Get outside, get some bright sunlight. Don't exercise too close to bed because it increases your temperature. It increases your body temperature just before your body actually wants it to drop because decreasing body temperature helps initiate sleep. Also, if you're doing it late at night, it'll produce cortisol, which keeps you awake. And especially if you're exercising in the gym, this is because the bright lights of the gym will stimulate your brain. It will keep you awake and it will block the production of melatonin, which is your sleep hormone. So we've covered off five tips now. Step six, I think, is the key one in terms of why our modern sleep is so disrupted, which is our use of technology into the evening. Our modern life is full, it's 24-7, it's 365 days a year, and it's really technology that's changed the amount of sleep that we've got because we use it too late and it stimulates the brain, it produces blue light, which blocks melatonin, and we're often on it far later than we ideally would have planned to have been. So if you're asking me in an ideal world, when would you stop tech? Two hours before bed. Obviously, for most of us, that's not possible. So at least one hour before bed to allow your brain to wind down, switch off. And if you're having a problem with blue light late at night, you could always consider these blue light blocking glasses and put all the dimmers on your tech, all the dimmers on your machines and PCs and laptops, and that would block blue light. Coming on to step seven, it's about consistency again, but consistency in a bedtime routine. If you think about how we get babies to sleep, we give them a specific wind down routine. We signal to them that bed's coming. We give them bath, book, bed. So ideally you create that same effect in your brain. You get the brain to anticipate that sleep's coming by having a consistent bedtime routine. You could read a book, you could have a bath, or you could do meditation, but do it in the same order seven nights a week and you'll find that that will help you get a better night's sleep. And then when it comes to the bedroom, make it cool, dark, and quiet like a cave. Temperature is a big initiator of sleep. So it's around about 18.3 degrees centigrade, quite cool, obviously dark. Light is the biggest single initiator of sleep. So get your bedroom to be dark. If you've got problems in the morning, blackout blinds would help. And in terms of quietness, the most complaints I get is about a partner snoring. Earplugs would, would help here, but don't use your tech in bed. That would be the biggest single hint in terms of getting a good night's sleep. Avoid tech in bed. And the other thing to do if you're finding that your sleep isn't a quality that you want is learn to breathe through your nose. Breathing through your nose increases the blood oxygenation and your brain needs oxygen, especially at night to recuperate. So use something called sleep tape and that will help you get a better night's sleep. And finally, in terms of what to do if you can't sleep, allow yourself 20 to 25 minutes in bed, then get out. What you don't want to happen is that your brain associates your bed with lying awake. And the way to stop that is if you just don't feel you're going to make it, if you don't feel you're going to be able to switch off, get out of the bedroom, start again, have a warm drink, read a book in very, very dim light. But ideally, don't lie awake stressing about sleep it's the last thing in the world to do because it gives your brain the association of bed equals awake and what we want is bed equals sleep so in terms of summary about routines bright light in the morning no coffee in the afternoon stop drinking three hours before bed finish your food then stop exercising earlier in the evening and turn off your tech ideally to last minute one hour before bed and that will really, with a consistent bedtime routine, get you to sleep. So let's look at some more practical ideas about how you can cope with stress, how you can decrease your stress in the evening and set yourself up for a good night's sleep. So I love nightly to-do lists. I love the idea of getting a brain dump early in the evening because I've always got too much to do. And I love the idea of getting that priority set up for the next day very early on and then it gives me the ability to relax. So writing down your priorities for the next day in a nightly to-do list. And then we come to techniques called non-sleep deep rest. And these include meditation, listening to sounds and yoga nidra, breathing techniques, relaxation techniques. So ideally 
getting those into your bedtime routine is a great way of getting yourself to relax at night and set up a brilliant night's sleep. And we've got tons of assets on the app. We've got meditations, stories, soundscapes. In terms of meditations, we've got a full body scan meditation, an unwind your day meditation, deep relaxation meditation, and even a fall asleep fast meditation. Then we've got sleep stories, help you settle at night, keep your mind relaxed and relaxing your body, and soundscapes. They're sonic experiences and, and it's a perfect way to get to sleep and even yoga we've got a wind down bedtime yoga so all of the stuff that you need is on the app and that will enable you to get a perfect night's sleep so these techniques these non-sleep deep rest are great ways of improving both your quality and quantity of sleep now coming back to the other key parts of dealing with stress getting better sleep we're just going to do a quick recap on diet and exercise we talked about the mediterranean diet we've talked about getting more magnesium but if you were to sort of ask me, what do I think my superfoods are for stress and sleep? I'd start with essential fatty acids. These are 60% of the brain is essential fatty acids. We get them from fatty fish. We get them from chia and flax seeds. So a component of stress and sleep would be these foods that provide essential fatty acids that we need to eat. Then I go to dark leafy greens. They're the nutritional superstar. They're antioxidants and our brain uses a lot of oxygen. So having things to protect it in terms of antioxidants are perfect. And fruit, another great source of vitamins and minerals and antioxidants. Dark berries stand out for the brain. Then we come to exercise. We know about exercise and mental health in terms of re releasing endorphins. And every single neurotransmitter in the brain loves exercise. It creates serotonin. It helps with dopamine release it makes us relax. So exercise every day. And then in terms of other things that you can add, it would be lavender. Lavender is a great smell. It's a perfect way of enhancing your bedroom. It creates relaxation. It's great for anxiety. It's great for stress. And of all of the aromas that are linked to a better night's sleep, lavender stands out as having the best research. One of the other areas that I get asked a lot about in terms of causing stress and interfering with sleep is home working. We're all doing a little bit more of it post the pandemic. And a lot of us found that we were essentially living at work. We didn't have the correct boundaries. We were blurring the boundaries, both physically in terms of time and where we were working. So some of the top home working tips that I have is to recreate the morning and evening commute. So split home mode from work mode by getting out of the house, getting out of your flat, start off with a commute, walk around the block in the evening, do the same and take regular breaks. You know, if you think about working in an office, you would have had natural breaks. So do the same if you're on Zoom calls, have a 50 minute hour and a 10 minute break so you can get out of your chair, do some stretching, make sure you take proper lunch hour and create a different space for work and where you live. So if you can't do it in a different room, ideally change the color scheme of the room, make it look differently and your brain will associate work mode with work or the work environment with work and change the decor, especially if you're working in your bedroom, tidy the work away, break it up with a different type of environment, different color scheme, different things on the bed, then get out of the bedroom, tidy your work away so your brain associates a different environment between work and rest and keep clear boundaries really tidy things away at the end of the day and do that to do list do your wind down routine and get things working in terms of breaking up work and rest and be really clear about where your boundaries are 